Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Curtis, and I'm glad to see you at Calvary Baptist Church today. And it really is nice to... Fellowship time is hard for me to break into. I love to fellowship with all of you and say hi and say good morning. And I'm sure you love to talk to those folks that you see and, and this morning see around you too. Make sure to meet someone new this morning if you can. Meet someone new at the end of the service today and, and say hi and introduce yourself. That's how the church can keep on growing as we meet each other and love each other and care about each other's needs. So make sure you do that this morning. That's my challenge for you. Hey, did anyone happen to catch the word of the day? Let's see the hands today. Okay, we got a big group today. All right, we, we had the announcements going long enough. Three, two, one. one. Okay, you're all invited. If you're a woman, <laughs> to lunch next Saturday, this coming Saturday, for ladies' luncheon. You guys, you're out of the picture, okay? We've got men's breakfasts. That's what that's for, okay? But ladies, you're all invited to lunch at, for, for this Saturday, and that's going to be a really good time, no doubt about it. And I found out today that the name lunch is actually Kyla Story's pig's name this year for the fair. <laughs> So maybe the pig makes a surprise appearance. I don't know. I don't know. Could be. Could be. So please do, ladies, come this Saturday. Uh, Heidi's put some information on the bulletin board. There's some information in your bulletin. But, you know, give her a heads up. Give her a shout and just say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm planning to come. But we'd love to see you there. She'd love to see you there. And, I'm, and all the ladies, that's a great time of fellowship. I always hear about it. There's a deacons meeting this Tuesday night. And uh, the deacons... We want to support our church, and we want to support our church well and lead our church well. And one of the ways you can do that is by letting us know if there's anything that you've been thinking about lately that our church, you'd like to see our church doing more of, or if there's any questions or comments or thoughts, just see a deacon this morning or see Pastor and I and let us know there's something you'd like for us to talk about at the meeting. We'd love to know what's on your heart. We'd love to talk about that. But be praying for those, those meetings. When you see that in the bulletin, I often tease and say, oh, it's just for the deacons' wives to remind the deacons, but it's a good time for you to pray for the leadership of our church too. So for you faithful prayers, you can pray for us Tuesday night. Thank you for that. There's a baby shower coming up for Summer and Keaton, and so please mark that on your calendar. That's in two Saturdays. We love to have babies growing and fill up the nursery at our church. We love to do that, so it's exciting that they're having their baby, and please do... Um, check in ways that you can, they're registered at Walmart, see what you might be able to get off of their registry for them. That would be nice. The last thing to make you aware of this morning, the last couple things, is out here in the hallway is the VBS um, registration table. How many kids have already registered? If you're a kid from our church, who already registered for VBS? Okay, we've got two. So, all of you kids, you got to get registered today for VBS and stop by the table and put your guests in for the Skittle jar and write your name down and your grade and do all that. So make sure you stop by and get registered. And if you're an adult here this morning, make sure you stop by the VBS table and you can admire the Skittle jar. You can't make a guess, but you can admire it. And, um, and, but we need your help with snacks so some other, and a few other items that are on that list. So please do stop by the table and check the ways that you can help. The last thing that you'll see that's a really big black bold announcement in the box here is we're just working on a facility and grounds crew team for our church. And so if, you're, if you have any interest in that, anyone at all, Stay next Sunday after church, and there's going to be a short meeting. We just need some people who are willing, able to help uh, upkeep of our church, upkeep of our building, and upkeep of the grounds around. So um, please do si come next Sunday and just see what that's about. And if you're even slightly interested, even like this much, well, I don't know, just come. Just come and check the meeting out. We'd love to have you for that. Anybody could help in that, no matter your age, no matter your size. So we'd love to have some interest meeting for that and, and explain to you what that's about. Praise team's going to come up, and they're going to lead us this morning. I uh, just have a few prayer requests to ask you to be praying for uh, through the week and uh, a little bit of update. Uh, Jason Bont's parents made it to Togo, and so continue to pray for them over the next few weeks. They're going to be in Togo ministering. Uh, Dr. Bont is serving at the Hospital of Hope there in Mango in Togo, and so be praying for him and for their ministry over these next few weeks. Uh, 
continue to pray for Mark Irani and for healing for him after his surgery this past week. He went well, but we would ask you to continue to pray, pray for him. Uh, pray for the kids that are at camp this week again and uh, for uh, opportunities uh, for spiritual growth this week. i got a good group of our kids that are going to be at camp this week. And then Natalie mentioned to me this morning to ask for prayer for Jane, uh, her grandma, tomorrow. Jane is having a procedure to remove the nerve blocking um, device that uh, she has. And so uh, pray for healing for her. Pray that that uh, might resolve some of the problems that she's had. And I know there's a lot of other uh, different prayer needs that folks have in our church, and I appreciate you praying for those daily and um, continue to do that. But before we jump into the, the message time, let's pray, okay? Father God, thank you so much for this morning. Sing that song, and it's an old-time uh, hymn, old-time favorite, uh, but it's a reminder that there is a day coming. When we'll see Jesus face to face, if we're your children, if we're your followers, uh, there's a better day. Uh, so easily in the cluttered and difficult world in which we live right now, uh, it is so easy for us to sort of get bogged down in the uh, depressing and the hard and the uncertainty. And whether that's the grand stage of our world or our country or maybe the smaller stage of our lives and some of the things that we're going through, it's easy to get weighted down in those things. And a reminder that if we know Jesus Christ, this life isn't the end. Uh, there's a much better life coming. And what a day it will be when we see Jesus face to face. Uh, Lord, I'm thankful for everybody that's here today. I'm thankful that you brought this group of people together on this Sunday. And I pray that you will continue to work during this service in a way that will bring change in us. Uh, help us to grow and move forward in our journey uh, with you. And I ask your blessing on your word as we open that together. I ask for your blessing on the different things that are happening and have been happening. <clears throat> we pray for the bonds and very thankful for their willingness to go up this month every summer and go and serve. Help missionaries there at the Hospital of Hope. Uh, missionary doctors that are overwhelmed and bogged down and, and uh, need a break. And I am really thankful for uh, Dr. Bont's willingness to travel and serve in that way. Watch over them th this week. The challenges both physically and just in the changed climate and different things that can happen there. I pray for your protection. I pray for healing and for your strength. Uh, Lord, I continue to pray for Mark. I pray that you would continue to heal him from the surgery. Thankful that it went well this week. And I pray for Jane and what she is going to go through tomorrow. Uh, Lord, she has that hope that this might help her feel better. And I pray, Lord, that you would work that way in this. Uh, you know her need. You know the best thing for her there. And we ask you to watch over and protect her uh, through tomorrow. And then, Lord, we do pray for the kids that are going to camp again this week. Uh, every week, there's been a different group, and I am so thankful for uh, the opportunity to send our kids to a camp that will teach them the Word of God, challenge them in their own spiritual journey. And for those young people that are going this week, Lord, I pray for your special uh, work in their hearts. Uh, cause them to be open to the Holy Spirit, open to the speakers and, and the Word of God as a counselors sit down and share that, different points that protect each of them and just work this week, we would pray in each of their lives. And work right now. I ask for that right now. And the things that we're going to dive into, uh, guide me, help us to be open to what your Holy Spirit wants us each to think about as we uh, expose our hearts to uh, the sharp edge of your word today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, we are in a study through the Gospel of Luke. Today we're going to be in Luke chapter 9. A couple weeks back I told you about the showdown between uh, Mama Robin and a somewhat ornery squirrel in our front uh, front yard. Uh, we had a bit of a development in that story last weekend because uh, I was uh, out uh, the, uh, sort of walking through the yard and noticed that uh, baby Robin started showing up in the grass. 
Thankfully, this time there's no squirrel nearby. But a week ago Saturday, I had planned to cut the grass, and so I was out picking up sticks and whatnot, just walking through the yard, and noticed uh, that there was, first of all, you hear it first, you know, hear this robin that is chirping like crazy up in a tree nearby, and so um, I was a little bit uh, cautious or aware of that. But then I noticed that right below that, there's this little robin in the grass. And um, upon you know, closer examination, I realized that and remembering you know, the fervency with which that mama protected the baby in the past, I decided to sort of step back a little bit. But I took this picture from a distance. Uh, you can't see it very well, but there's a picture of the baby robin in the back of our, of our yard. And this is one I stole off the internet that gives you a better idea of what I was seeing. <laughs> Uh, but in any case, like I said, I just you know I remembered the vengeance with which that mama um, decided to uh, attack that squirrel. I decided that I wasn't going to mow the lawn that day. Instead, I'll sit in the lawn chair and look and see what happens. And it was rather interesting to watch, is because as I sat there, it turned out there was one robin just sort of hopping you know through the grass there, and uh, it followed its mom over to this collection point where she was calling him to, and then another robin showed up in the grass right there at the base of the tree and then a third robin and ended up being four robins down in the grass just one at a time just sort of popped up I think maybe it was kick your kid out of the nest day or something in our backyard but it was just really interesting to observe because this mother robin would you know would fly over them and fly to where she wanted them to go and they would hop along hop through the grass and a few times one of the other of them would you know, tried to flap their wings and whatnot, but nobody got it off the ground. You know, no, no, nobody got up in the air at all. And it just looks so weird to see these baby birds trying to navigate through tall grass. Um, uh, robins are made not to hop through the grass. Robins are made to fly over and to soar. And God created them that way. God created them to soar above the grass, not get bogged down in it. I'm um, pretty sure, I did see one like the next day still uh, lingering around, but I'm pretty sure by now they've all figured it out. But if you imagine if one of those robins decided that it was just going to stay a land creature, you know, I'm just going to stay on the ground, just going just gonna to hop around the rest of uh, its way through life. Uh, for one, it probably wouldn't live very long because we've got a lot of hungry cats that roam through our neighborhood. Uh, but then secondly, you know, think about that, it would miss out on so much. It would miss out on the whole way that God designed that bird to live. So much that it could see, so much that it, it could experience when soaring through the sky. Because robins weren't born for hopping in the grass, right? Robins were born with a higher calling, with a greater, a greater mission. And I lead that, share that this morning, sort of a lead into talking about you and I in the same way. Because the same is very much true for followers of Jesus Christ. We have a higher calling. Now, the Bible very often uses the imagery of a person placing their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation as a new birth experience. In fact, it was Jesus himself in John chapter 3 that used that most common analogy with Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to him at night and, and he had questions and Jesus jumped right in to say, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. And so Jesus introduced that, that, that picture of spiritual new birth. And it's a good one. It's a fitting one. Upon placing your faith in Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection for you, we are given a new spiritual life. We are placed into the family of God. All that happens in that instant when you are born again. And that only has to happen one time. Everyone was only born physically one time. And you are only born spiritually anew one time. And we're placed into the family of God. And I, I hope this morning that you've experienced that. I hope that you can look back at a time in your life when you recognized your sin, your need. You understood who Jesus is and what he did. And you made that decision. You put your faith in Christ alone uh, for salvation. But if you have, if that is your, uh, you know, a part of your life story, I want you to realize this morning 
that just like those baby robins in my yard, you've been born into God's family with a higher calling, with a higher purpose, with a greater mission. See, the, the Christian life begins with the new birth, but doesn't end there. That's just the beginning of the story for you in your journey with God and what God wants to accomplish through your life. The, the great commission that Jesus gave uh, his followers is to go and make disciples, not make spiritual baby robins, but make grown-up maturing disciples who are fully committed and pursue his mission in this world. Now today we're going to step back into our study in the Gospel of Luke. Like I said before, if you've got a Bible or the Bible app on your phone, find chapter 9 and verse 57 is where we're going to pick it up. I want to cover a bunch of verses mainly because they all deal kind of with the same thing. And the focus is, is all on what pursuing the mission God has called you and me to do in this world should look like. And looking at it through the lens of uh, his, his disciples in that day. Now, you kind of have to set the section in its, in its particular context. Uh, earlier in chapter 9, Jesus made a crucial turn. He made a crucial turn towards the cross. And you read about it in verse 51. The text describes how Jesus was beginning his journey toward Jerusalem for the last time. And it's going to take a while to get there. I was thinking this week that's a lot like pastor sermons sometimes. It takes a long time to get there. Uh, in Luke, you're not going to get to Palm Sunday until chapter 19, and we're only in chapter 9. And so all of these chapters in between are the journey towards Jerusalem in that last few months of Jesus' life. But the trip is in motion. And uh, last time we closed with James and John wanting to call down fire on this town that was a little bit inhospitable towards them. And right after that, in Luke chapter 9, verse 57, you read this. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom, kingdom of God. Now, I'm not smart enough to plan it this way, but it is kind of interesting to me that this text and the sermon comes one week after we had a missionary here. Uh, Jeff and Jody Demerly were here last Sunday sharing about their calling and the calling of God in their lives. And missionaries are individuals that at some point in their past heard God's call uh, to serve him full time in some way or to some place and they've answered that. They have followed that. They, they're committed to uh, responding to that call usually with commitment and usually with tremendous sacrifice. And, and these verses, the verses that I just read there, I think they give a good glimpse behind the scenes on what that must be like for a missionary and they give us a sort of a, a look behind the, the curtain for what missionaries experience in that process. But it also connects with every single one of us. Um, you know, some are called by God to a more obvious role of ministry as pastors or missionaries. But all of us who follow Jesus Christ are called by God to serve him to live lives for him. It's part of the reason that God saved you. And, and I know we might not automatically think of that uh, that way, but it, it is very true. God saved you to first rescue you from your sin, but also to give you something to do for him in this world. I want you to look at a familiar verse with me. Ephesians chapter 2, very familiar verses. We learn these verses in Awana, very uh, sort of sum up the gospel message. Now Paul wrote, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Salvation is a free gift. It is all of God's grace. There's nothing that you need to do in order to accomplish your salvation or earn your salvation. It is a free gift of God's grace that you receive by faith. 
you and I put our faith in what Jesus Christ did and we're given the gift of forgiveness of sin, new birth into the family of God, new spiritual life. Salvation is all of God's grace and those are wonderful verses to explain that initial birth experience uh, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. But the, the line of thought does not stop with the end of verse 9 because in verse 10 Paul said this, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith, it's not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know, that first part, it outlines God's plan of salvation and, and how salvation is deserved by no one, cannot be earned by anyone. But we often overlook how the rest of it goes. We often overlook verse 10, where Paul says God saved you because he has some things he wants you to do. He has a mission for you in your life and in this world. You have gifts, you have abilities to use, you have a circle of influence that God has placed you among as an opportunity to impact those individuals through your life. And so, what I want to talk about, what I want to think about, both from these and the next set of verses in, in chapter 10, is that you have a mission, you have a higher calling, you have something that God wants you to do in your life. Uh, ministry is not just for those who have a, the vocation of ministry. Ministry is for every single person who is an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. And it's important to understand some things as we move into that. Uh, the first thing is this, that there's always a cost. There's a cost to pay in serving Jesus. You might notice, if you look back through the verses I read there, that three people interact with Jesus Christ and they all, they all have this conversation with him uh, about being his follower. And, and Jesus' answer to each of those individuals highlights that there's a cost to pay in being his follower, being his disciple. Uh, the first one sounds kind of committed. I will follow you wherever you go. But when Jesus points out, you know what, I don't even have a place to put my head down at night. Uh, no possessions that I own. No place to call my own. The interaction just seems to evaporate. We don't know what happens with that conversation then. Uh, the second discussion, Jesus invites an individual uh, says to another man, follow me, invites the man to follow him. And his reply is, Lord, first, first let me bury my father. Now, we read that and, and that seems reasonable, right? You know, why wouldn't you let somebody go to the funeral home and do that? Um, and his response, Jesus' response, sounds a little bit heartless. Um, but... What is happening is not what we might initially think in our particular culture. In that, in that day, in that time, funerals were held the same day that a, that a person died. You know, within 24 hours, a funeral was held every single time. There was an embalming and all that sort of thing. And so if this uh, man's father had just died, he wouldn't be walking along the road having a casual conversation with a group of travelers. Uh, he would be taking care of his father's funeral. And so what, what he's saying here, you know, his father was alive and well, but he knew that one day, maybe soon, maybe, maybe years from now, his father was going to die, and then uh, he would get some inheritance. And uh, that was really important to him, to make sure he was prepared for that, he was ready for that. And so he was saying, you know, first let me settle this. You know, first let me put my finances in order. Let me make sure my retirement plan is fully funded. Then I will follow you. And the last one is very similar. He says, uh, I'll follow you, Lord, but first. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And again, it just, that seems like a reasonable request. Uh, but it brings a harsh reply from Jesus. And his point is that if you truly follow me, then even the, the closest relationships you have won't prevent you from doing what I want you to do and prevent you from serving God. And I think if you put all those things back together, uh, it, over and over again, Jesus is pointing out, not just to these three individuals, but to, to his own disciples that were in the crowd uh, following him, walking with him, that there is a cost if you're going to be fully committed to me, if you're going to be fully committed to following. And it may cost you possessions, it may cost you wealth, it may cost you the security of the relationships that you count on. 
And, and again, you know, like I said before, I definitely think of missionaries in this realm. I mean, we live in a day when travel is a lot easier. You can be on the other side of the globe in 24 hours. Um, but for hundreds of years, those individuals that would leave for a mission field, uh, serving God on some foreign field, they had to say goodbye to their family. They had to leave behind all of their possessions. And they would take themselves and their kids far from their families. And as a grandpa, now I can feel the weight of what that must have felt like for those left behind and how big of a decision that was. There was a price to pay to fulfill God's calling. Missionaries have done that over and over and over again. Been willing to pay that price, and many today still do uh, that same, pay that same price. Uh, and you and I, you know, might not be, uh, need to leave your family any more than you need to give up all your money or, uh, you know, sell your house in order to serve Christ. That, that is likely not something God's calling us to do. But the point is, if you are serious about serving God, it's going to cost you something. Uh, sacrifice will be, be required. And I think it's a valuable question to ask, how is following Jesus costing you? If he were here and we were walking along the road with him and he said, follow me, would you be willing to pay a price? Or do we very quickly make excuses, have reasons why right now isn't the best time to serve you? Why right now isn't the best time to follow? Now, we don't know what happened to these three guys. It's kind of uh, sort of a, a word thing, a mental picture to imagine, you know, what did they do? What did they decide? What choice did they make in all of that? Did they follow? Did they turn back? We, we really don't know. And God doesn't tell us. God leaves it open-ended to make us wonder, what did they decide? Maybe as this pride that we would think about, if I was in their shoes, what would I decide? Would I be willing to pay the price? There is a cost. There is a cost to serving Jesus. Um, and whether it's possessions, money, family, time, something else, if you're serious, it'll, it'll cost you something. Now that story re leads right past the chapter break to the next one because you keep reading it in chapter 10, verse 1, it says this, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest. Uh, last Sunday, Jeff Demerly referenced those same words. Uh, he, if you remember, had those 938 cards because he was quoting from Matthew chapter 9 and verse 38 where the exact same phrase is found where Jesus said, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send workers out into the harvest field. And Jeff's challenge was, set your alarm for 938, you know, and, and remember to pray that prayer that God would send workers out into his harvest. Uh, in this particular context, Jesus has followed up the uh, the problems with gaining access into that one town in Samaria by uh, commissioning a whole bunch of teams. 72 of his closest friends he paired up and commissioned to go out ahead and, and prepare the way so that that kind of thing doesn't happen again. And then he tacks on that statement. He tells them, you know, as you're going, as you're going to each place, and he's going to give instructions about that, but as you're going, pray. And ask God to send workers, laborers into the harvest field. Uh, as you are going, as you are doing what I'm calling you to do, pray that God would call others to do the same thing. Um, when I was out in western New York last month visiting my mom for a few days, uh, she had a whole bunch of stuff that I now have in the basement and a tote. But... Among that was an envelope with all kinds of pictures that either I was in as a little kid or whatnot and different pictures that she's come across. She's sort of trying to sort out all those kind of things. And in the packet of pictures that uh, she gave to me, I found uh, this particular picture. It is a class photo from 1976 when I was in the sixth grade at Meadow Elementary School. Now we'll do a very quick quiz. Where do you think I am on the screen up there? Without the su suspense lingering too long. Right up in the top right hand corner there. The pink shirt, the flipped over hair, and the very fashionable brown bow tie. <laughs> 
There was a couple in the class that year had the fashionable bow tie going on. Um, uh, I, I had to smile, you know, it's, it's always fun to go back and see pictures from way back when. But that particular school photo stood out to me for a couple reasons. You know, one is the bow tie. Uh, but the other is that sixth grade was kind of a pivotal year in my life. Uh, sixth grade was when we had a missionary come to our church and I really felt God tugging on my heart uh, to consider a life of, of ministry. And I remember this very distinctly because uh, in the spring of 1977, uh, our church had special meetings and I felt so compelled, you know, we had a special speaker come in and back in the day you'd have meetings all night long, all week long, and it'd be pack a few nights, some nights and things like that. And, and uh, I felt so compelled that God wanted me to be a witness to my classmates that I took enough flyers uh, to go and place a flyer in every one of my fellow students' class, uh, hoping, you know, beyond hope that maybe they would respond and come and join me at church for that week of meetings. And uh, as an 11-year-old kid, that was pretty much a weak attempt at evangelism, but uh, it, it sticks in my mind because God was placing in my heart this desire to serve Him somehow. I didn't know how, but to serve Him somehow in the world. And in 1976, that was my mission field. Those were the people that I spent most of my, my time with, 1976 to 1977. And seeing those faces, I don't know what happened to any of them, really. And some of them I had closer relationships with than others, but don't know what happened to any of them. But for this one window, this one period of time, uh, they were the people that God called me to try and reach for Him. And that's really, that's how it works. God reaches people through people. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, he's calling you to step into the field of ministry among the people that you are uh, uh, around all the time right now. I think this is uniquely personal. Every one of us has a circle of friends, a circle of coworkers, neighbors that God has placed us in a relationship with partly because he wants you to be a witness to them. He wants you to be his representative right there. And, and you know, thinking about your higher calling, uh, you know, we can recognize there's this need for servants. We should pray that God would send workers into the harvest field. But we also should recognize that in a very real way, we're all an answer to that prayer. That you are an answer to that prayer for the people that you live nearby. You are an answer to the prayer for the people that are in your class at school. You are an answer to that prayer. God wants you to be part of the answer to the need for servants of Jesus Christ. Now, he rounds up these 72 disciples, gives them some instructions, and, and if you pick up where I stopped reading, verse 3, very first thing he says is, go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Now that isn't probably the most encouraging start to a pre-game pep talk, but he wanted to know there would be challenges, and that's the third thing that I put on here. There's a cost, there's a need, but there's also challenges. There will be challenges when serving, serving Christ. Let me just read over a whole chunk of this material and, and follow along. It says in verse 4, Jesus is talking to these 72 disciples and he says, Do not take a purse or bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking, whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and you're not welcomed, go into its streets and say even the dust of your town will be wiped from our feet as a warning. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Verse 13, Woe to you Chorazin, woe to you Bethsaida, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, 
you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. Now those were marching orders for these specific 72 individuals. They were going out on these missions to go to these towns, prepare the way for Jesus to come. In a very real way, the kingdom of God was about to show up in our town. And would they be opening? Would they be welcoming? Or would they not? They begin very practical in nature. Jesus says, as you go to a town, go in and stay with those that welcome you. Uh, and uh, move on from those that don't. Uh, what they were being called to do in this next little bit of time as representatives of Jesus, what they were being called to do would not always look like success. Sometimes they would be welcomed. Sometimes they would uh, be rejected. Sometimes they would be victorious, it would seem. Sometimes it would feel like a loss. Sometimes it would feel like uh, discouragement uh, very quickly could set in. And he wanted them to expect challenges ahead of time. And then in the second part there that I read, uh, he points out the same thing had been true of him. For two years now, Jesus had been ministering uh, uh, in Israel, going from town to town, preaching and healing and doing so many dramatic things. He'd been involved in public ministry. And some of those locations and some of those experiences are recorded for us in the Gospels. But there's a lot more that was happening and there's a lot more uh, places that he went than what got recorded in the four Gospels. And these verses attest to that. I mean, we don't have any record anywhere in the Gospels of Jesus ministering in Chorazin. But he says, you saw so much, you, you uh, experienced so much of my presence uh, that you're held accountable for that one day. Uh, he pronounces this woe, a statement of curse in a sense, over the towns of Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum because they had the privilege of seeing Jesus firsthand so many things, hear him teach so uh, much profound truth, and yet most of them had rejected him. Most of them had just brushed that off. Despite what you might assume, because we you know, just have what's recorded for us in these four Gospels, uh, Jesus' ministry was not met with unmitigated success. There was repeated challenges. There were repeated times when people refused to respond. And he tells them that, he reminds them that in, the, in their little uh, ministry tour here as very important pre-mission pre, uh, trip information. Not everything you do for God is going to be a smashing success. Uh, that's okay. Do it anyway. Despite the challenges, don't give up. There will always be challenges. And as I pull this forward into our day and in our world and our experiences, there are definitely challenges in the world that you and I live in. If we're going to be serious about communicating God's word, representing him in this world, there are significant challenges. Um, at the conference uh, last week, I had a conversation with a pastor friend who's involved in uh, somewhat the public discourse there in the Grand Rapids community. He pastors a influential church there. He's been there for about 20 years. And uh, he said that in the past year, 10 years or so, the past decade, the culture of the city of Grand Rapids has changed very much. There are so many religious institutions and whatnot in the Grand Rapids area and, and whatnot. But he, he pointed out that the culture has changed from a perspective of very openness and welcoming to uh, Christianity and Christian organizations to a mindset of uh, much greater secularism. Uh, and I, you know, this, he was telling me that, and, and I was thinking about that conversation later. I remember when I first moved up here, moved to central Michigan, I had a friend tell me that we were coming to the Bible Belt of the Midwest because of all the Christian organizations in Grand Rapids and, and how so much is uh, Christian uh, groups and publishing houses and whatnot are, are based there. And, and Jeff explained in his view that has drastically changed just in the past 10 years. The influence of Christianity has radically waned in the public sector. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and it's not just Grand Rapids. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Uh, a few years back, and this is uh, eight years ago, 2014, there was a, a poll conducted in the UK by the Bible Society. And this, the results are rather stunning. The poll was taken of 800 kids, ages 8 to 15, so young teenagers, and 1,000 of their parents. 
And from that poll, 43% of the parents felt it was important for kids to read the Bible and to understand Bible stories. 43%. So, you know, pushing half of those parents said, yeah, this is really important uh, to teach our kids. And yet, these were some of the results of the poll. 30% of the kids did not know the nativity story came from the Bible, didn't know that Christmas was a story that was rooted in God's Word. Uh, 46% of the kids did not recognize the story of Noah and the flood as coming from the Bible, coming from God's Word. Uh, 30% of the parents did not recognize the plot of the story of Adam and Eve. Uh, And the last one may be humorous, but maybe not. 54% of the parents thought the plot of the Hunger Games began as a Bible story. Now, it's 2014. The Hunger Games was just kind of new out in 2012 or whatnot. Um, But it gives you a perspective of the lack of Bible awareness, of uh, biblical awareness of people. And again, you know, that's eight years ago. Uh, You look at where we are today in 2022, and and, uh, I would guess that if we were to take a poll today, those numbers would be significantly different. Um, in more recent days, the hostility towards the Christian faith has intensified in the world in which you and I live. I read an article this week in the Baptist Bulletin about the Dobbs decision that was actually written uh, before the Dobbs decision came out and talking about um, how that would impact our society. And they shared that according to a 2021 national survey by the Family Research Council uh, here in America, only 6% of Americans have a biblical worldview. Uh, that means only 6% of those that, would, that, you know, that are Americans say they look at their lives through the lens of what God's Word has to say. And flip that over, 94% don't. Um, 94% don't. And, and the article then gave this example. They wrote, consider the reaction to a tweet published by Family Research Council last fall that simply stated the Bible is ardently and unequivocally pro-life. I don't know about you, but I would completely agree with that. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 tells us that human beings were created by God in a special way, bear the image of God that makes every single human life precious. And you can just walk your way through the Bible from that first chapter forward and find that, that uh, God uh, holds high the value of every human life. You can go to Psalm 139 and find out that God is the one who creates every human being in their mother's womb. And even unborn children are, are precious to God. Uh, you can go to Jeremiah chapter 1 and, and, and find that God knows us as individuals. God has a plan for our lives as individuals even before we are born. And, and over and over again, the Bible verifies that statement. The Bible is uh, ardently and unequivocally pro-life. Um, but they wrote there that within just a few days of that, the tweet had gone viral, generated 20 million impressions across social media, 218,000 engagements, and 17,000 replies. And then it said this, approximately 95% of the replies were negative, with Twitter users claiming that family, the Family Research Council was misquoting the Bible and that scripture does not affirm the personhood of the unborn or say anything that could be interpreted as opposition to abortion. And then the last line there, many self-professed Christians condemned it. That's 2021. Um, I think we're seeing that in our culture over the past couple weeks, the hostility towards that decision that came down. Uh, And it it reflects, and it's just one issue, but it it reflects uh, the culture in which we live having an increasing hostility towards the biblical truth uh, of God's word and the morality uh, that is portrayed there and definitely uh, the exclusive gospel of Jesus Christ that is communicated. And so that's the world that we live in. And you and I are called called to be his representative in that world. That brings some challenges. In a very real way, the mission field is spreading to our front doors. 
It is going to be increasingly difficult to be serious about following Jesus Christ and representing him in this world, but it is still our calling. It is still our mission. Uh, the message of hope that is found in Scripture is the same message uh, that has been shared for 2,000 years and it is needed in our world more than ever before. Uh, there are challenges in serving Jesus, but there are also enormous blessings. And this is how the whole section closes. Verse 17. 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. These 72 missionaries, uh, you know, from this little trip that they've been on, they come back, they're excited about what God did through their lives. Uh, and uh, to them, the highlight is, you know, even the demons listen to us. Even the demons d uh, did what, what we said when we mentioned your name. And Jesus points out, well, there's a reason for that. I saw Satan fall. You know, Jesus was there when Satan was kicked out of heaven, uh, when in his pride he fell from his throne. Uh, Jesus is greater than, than uh, Satan, and God is greater. Uh, Jesus was there, and Jesus already knows, already knew as he was telling them this, the final page of the book, and how one day Satan would be cast into the eternal lake of fire. Uh, a little sidelight. Uh, where he says there, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Uh, that's not talking about literal snakes. That's why we don't do snake handling here. But over and over from Genesis 3 forward, uh, there uh, Satan is portrayed as a serpent. You go to the book of Revelation and some demons are portrayed as scorpions. And what Jesus is saying is, I've given you authority over those. My power is greater than the enemy, the spiritual opposition in this world. And though it may seem as though the spiritual forces of darkness are winning in our world, Jesus is greater. And in the end, God, God is victorious. He applauds their ministry, reminds them of his gifting. But notice the end of that. Don't rejoice that you have this uh, apparent success. Rejoice that your name is written down in heaven. That's the, that's the greatest thrill. That's the greatest and most important joy. Uh, that uh, you have personally experienced God's amazing grace. And then it closes with this. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows uh, who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not see hear it. Jesus had to smile at this team of 72 because they were not the elite. They were not the ones everybody expected to be credentialed and gifted, successful. They were like little children. And yet they came to know Jesus. They got to see him and hear him and their lives were changed by him. And though no one would expect it, they were willing to step into ministry roles that made a difference in their world. It is the way Jesus worked on his final trip towards Jerusalem and it is still the way Jesus is working today through people. Uh, there are costs, there are challenges in serving Jesus, but the blessing of being in a personal relationship with him and, and then seeing the impact he can make in the lives of others through you makes those challenges and those costs pale in comparison. Now again, it would be easy to sort of write this sermon off as one for those who are in vocational ministry, right? Uh, the pastors and the missionaries out there. But I want to bring it back as we close to where we started. Um, the question is really important. Do you know Jesus yourself? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ yourself? Have you responded to the good news that he came here out of love to die in your place so your sin could be forgiven? Have you responded to that? 
And if you're not sure, I would love to talk to you about that or somebody else here would be glad to talk with you about that. But if so, I think it's a valid question to ask. What are the good deeds you're doing? What is the impact your life is having? What are you doing for God that he planned in advance for you to do? What's your higher calling? Ephesians 2 is very clear. That's part of why God saved you. Because he has something for you and me to do. There's a role you have to play in this world in reaching people with the gospel. And for all of us, that might look a little different. For you, what does that look like? Are you doing what God has called you to do? Now, I know the possibility is that some of you are thinking, well, Pastor must really need people on that facility team that he's meeting with next week, or, or uh, he's trying to recruit for a while already, or the nursery or children's church or whatever. And in one sense, that's true. We need people in all those ministries here, but that really is not my point this morning. Really is not my point. Uh, it is not uh, as much what our church might need as much as it is about each of us considering what God has called each of us to be doing and how God wants to use you to impact your sphere of influence. Because if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, if you have been born again, you were born again for more than hopping around in the tall grass. You were born into God's family with a higher calling and a grander mission and he wants to use you right now in this world in which we live, in this time and in your circle of influence, of friends and family and neighbors and coworkers and, and classmates. He wants to use you to reach people for his kingdom. You might not be a preacher or a teacher, but you can be a light in that circle. Uh, you can invite friends to church or to youth group or uh, kids I would advise skipping the geeky bow tie, but you can invite your friends, you know, to vacation Bible school in a month. If you're a child of God, it doesn't matter how old you are. You have something to do for God right now. You have someone that God wants to use you to reach for Him. And as we close this morning, I just really want to challenge you, consider that. What does that look like in your life? Maybe who? Who does that look like that God is calling you to reach for him? The last blanks there. What about you? Are you committed? Are you committed to serve God in the way he's called and gifted you? It will not be easy, but it will be eternally worth it. Yeah, let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for the example of these 72 individuals and others that were walking along the road with Jesus Christ to whom he could give this challenge, this mission, this job to do for him. And in that setting, it was, it was a very specific role. And yet there's so many principles that trickle down from that for every single one of us. We all, if we are followers of yours, if we're disciples of Jesus, we have a role. We have something to be doing for you. Not just something to do in life. Not just stuff to accumulate or money to make or success to seemingly accomplish. We have something to be doing for you. And I pray this morning we'll ask some honest questions about what that is. Uh, it's, every one of us is different. This is a uniquely personal thing. But for every single one of us, there are ways to respond to this today. So help us consider what that looks like. I pray that your Holy Spirit would tug at our hearts to take this along, to continue to percolate over it this week, and to have eyes that are a little bit more open than they tend to be, to see the people around us, see the opportunities around us and see the calling that you have given us to have in this world. In Jesus' name I pray.